Thank you, Kate. Um, I, I was decided I wanted to preach on it and I opened it and I saw all the tricky names and I thought someone else can just read it for me. <laughs> I'm joking, but that's fine. Um, my name's Luke. I'm a, I'm a pastor at a church called Hills Baptist. I actually work with Matt's brother, uh, Ben. So if you know Ben, um, I work with him. There you go. Um, I've come to excess, I think, probably once a year for the last six years. And there's some of you that I'm looking at who are like leaders or like year 11s, I assume. No year 12s here. Um, or year 12s. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I'm just looking at you going, wow, I remember uh, when you were in year like six or seven and I came here. And what that does, when you come back to just a place once a year um, and I don't know you very well, it's really encouraging. It's so encouraging to see young people who came into a place at year like six or seven or eight who are still here. It's awesome. God's doing something in a generation that's causing people to stick at it, to be faithful, to stay in church. And uh, yeah, I'm always very encouraged um, when I'm here. Oh, my computer's about to restart. Got it. Stopped it. All right. So tonight... um, I want to share with you from, yeah, from this book, Philemon. It's kind of a, it's a book most people probably haven't heard of, or unless you like actually read your Bible a lot and you've read all the way through. It's sort of a one page, one chapter book that's tucked away in the end of the Old Testament. Um, And it's written by Paul. It's a letter. uh, And it's written to a guy named Philemon. So to kind of explain the book, I I would like three volunteers, actually, and I want a prize before, so if you volunteer, you can have my prize, I guess. Anyone? Is there anyone here named Paul? Oh, there is. Great. Paul, you can can be my first. I'll take that, Paul. He looks cooler. Come on up. (laughs) Is there anyone here named Philemon? Yep, you'll do. Come on up. And is there anyone here called Onesimus? Yeah, great. That'll work. Obviously not really. So just because we've read the letter, but it may or may not have made any sense. And I kind of want to explain what's what's going on. Has anyone here ever um, sat in an English class before? Good. Has anyone ever done a topic on persuasive writing? Okay, great. So you're kind of familiar. So what this letter is, is it's it's a piece of persuasive writing. So Paul's the writer... Paul, you're the writer. Wave. Can you actually go over there? Thank you. I need you to be in prison, so that's good. I can put you in the drum box, actually. That's kind of... No, that's fine. Um, So Paul has written the letter from prison. So look a bit sadder. You're in prison. Thank you. Um, And he's written it to Philemon, who's not in prison. He's over here. And Onesimus, you go over there, actually. Onesimus is the person delivering the letter... To Philemon. The problem with this, and the reason Paul's written it, and the, the potential awkwardness that comes with this letter, is that Onesimus used to be a slave of Philemon, who stole something and ran away. Now, steal and run. That's good. And that was a crime that was punishable by crucifixion. Ooh. Yeah. So... If a slave, back in those days, 2,000 years ago, stole something from a master and took off, that was a crucifiable crime. So, when you think of it that way, and Paul's written this letter, and he's like, Anisimus, you could take it back. That's a scary thing that's happening here. Because Anisimus does not know how Philemon's going to respond. Philemon might be like, all right, it's crucifixion time. Or he might do something different. That's really, I like that. And so what Paul is trying to persuade Philemon to do is he's trying to persuade him to look at Onesimus differently. And that's kind of, that's the, that's our context. That's our subtext for what's happening in this letter. Thank you guys. That's great. You can, you can sit back down. Really well done. And Paul uses this language Now, you've probably heard it said that you can't choose your family. And 
this is true. You're like, you're born where you're born with the parents you have, with the siblings you have. You, you don't have a say in that. You're just, you, just you're born and, and there you are. And uh, for some people, talking about family just is a no dramas topic because you really enjoy the place you live. You have good relationships with your family. And I know though that realistically, there's probably some people in the room that talking about family can be something that's a bit not so nice. Maybe there's tension or there's strained relationships or there's things that are happening at home that aren't good. And it can be something that's very painful. One of the things that we believe that Jesus changes is the nature of families. He changes families, he changes people, and he also changes the way that we view family. So what I want to talk about tonight is this idea that Paul, writing to Philemon, is asking him not to look at Onesimus as a slave, but to look at him as family. And not family in a broken sense, but family in a, an incredible, full sense. So there's three, I'm a three-point sermon guy, because I'm a Baptist. Um, if, I was, if I was at a Baptist church, that would have got a huge laugh, but not here, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> but we're talking about the truth. We're going to talk about there's a, there's a reality with family. We're going to talk about some of the challenges that happen in family. And then we're going to talk about the hope for family because there is hope. So you may have noticed that throughout the letter, Paul uses family kind of terms and language a lot. He refers to Timothy in his intro as a, as a brother, this lady called Aphia as a sister, Onesimus as a son, Onesimus as a brother, and then finally he ends by calling Philemon, the receiver of the letter, a brother. So Paul, five times in 25 verses, uses family like titles or language to talk about other people. So he's trying to like really build this picture around family. He wants people to see each other as family, but more than that, he actually seems to believe that Christians are family. That we're not just to look at each other like, like family, but actually that we are family. And you might think, well, where did Paul kind of get that idea from? But it's this idea that, that it's all through the New Testament, that those who put their faith in Jesus, first of all, become part of God's family. That's why we call God, God our Father but also a family with one another. In uh, the first book of, in the first chapter of John, so John was one of Jesus' disciples, he says this about Jesus. He calls him the true light that gives light to everyone. And he was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did, so this is all who received Jesus, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. So what this is saying is, if you believe in Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is Lord, if you've asked Jesus to be part of your life, then you've entered this family that makes you, first of all, a child of God, but also siblings with one another. Just have a think about that. I know you guys have just been looking at the book of Ephesians, and in the first chapter of Ephesians, Paul says that everyone, he calls like the guys and the girls, he calls everyone sons, and he says you're all part of the same family. Whether you're from this place or this place, we're actually all together as one. So it's this thing that happens through the Bible a lot, that there's this truth about family, that we are family. So that's our first, like we're, just, we're just kind of establishing that we are. So look to the person next to you, look them dead in the eyeballs, and say, we are family. My guy in the third row, we are family. 
There we go. He had no one. So that's great. Awesome. And it's great. We're family. That's all well and good. It's exciting. But it doesn't deal with some of the challenges that being a family brings. Has anyone heard of a book of the Bible called Genesis? It's at the start. Um, And at the start of the Bible, God creates the first family. There's Adam, there's Eve, and they have two sons, Cain and Abel. And so this is right at the beginning of the Bible. This is like chapter four of the whole Bible. The Bible's quite big. This is like really early on. And we get this incredible story about the first ever family. It'll be great, right? So Adam and Eve, they have a, have a son. They call him Cain. They then have another son and they call him Abel. And Cain and Abel, they get together and they're like, we want to worship God. This is like the first worship service in the Bible, so we should probably like, you know, pay attention to how things are done. And they get together and they're like, well, I think God would like us to offer him something. So Abel, he's like a, he looks after animals, so he brings a sheep and he offers the sheep to God. And then Cain, he works the fields, he's more of a crops guy, brings some like uh, stuff that he's grown and he brings that before God. And what happens is that God accepts Abel's offering. He says, Abel, this sheep is amazing, I love it, thank you. He doesn't accept Cain's offering. And it says that Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Like that. I've got a three-year-old nephew and he's, um, he's really cute, but he's also sometimes a little bit annoying, as three-year-olds can be. And when he doesn't get his own way, like if he's like, Uncle Luke, can we go play on the road? And I'll be like, no, that's not safe. He's just like, Ugh! like stamps his feet. And then he's like, you can see he's like thinking, oh, what else can we do? Uncle Luke, can we play in the oven? It's like, no. And he's like, Ugh! he gets really angry. Whatever, like, but anyway, he has this downcast face. That's what I'm imagining on Cain here. He's tried to offer God some plants, and God's like, I don't want your plants, Cain. Anyway, what happens next is really exciting. And I say that a little bit sarcastically. This is the first family in the whole Bible. So, Genesis 4. Verse 6, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why are you downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So God said, Cain, I can see you're angry. Don't give in to temptation. Don't do something that you might regret. And Cain is like, okay, goes to his brother Abel and says, Abel, let's go out to the field And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. That's the first family in the Bible. (laughs) The first family in the whole history of families ends with a brother killing another brother. So obviously, for a long time, ever since the beginning there's been some issues in families. There's been some things that haven't always gone right. There's been some things that have worked out poorly. And, you know, I've got a couple of younger brothers and an older sister, and there's definitely times where, like, if I'm being honest, sometimes one of them would annoy you so much that you thought about, oh, I'm not going to kill them, but, man, I want to hurt them. (sighs) I think you're all, you laugh, but I think everyone with siblings has felt that way at some point. And the first family, this is what happens. So families, right, that should be a place that are safe, should be a place where people can exist without being murdered, are broken. And the pattern goes on. And if you read the Bible, and if you read through the Old Testament, and you read through the New Testament, you'll see again and again and again this cycle of family ending badly. We seem to be unable 
as humans to treat our families well. And even in the church, people can get hurt, even in the family that God has given us. Not just our biological family, but in our, in our church family, people can still be hurt. And so this letter, back to Philemon, it presents a real challenge because Paul is saying to Philemon, this guy that deserves death for what he's done, I want you to see him as a brother, not as a slave. I want you to change the pattern of families treating each other badly. I want you to welcome him home. And that's tough. So Philemon, the guy who gets the letter, he's faced with two questions. Do I forgive Onesimus? First of all, can I forgive someone that's hurt me? And you might be like, well, he shouldn't have had slaves anyway. That's how they did things in that culture. We're not, whether it's right or wrong is kind of beside the point for now. But a slave in the household was someone who was really trusted. He wasn't like someone who was just like sweeping the floors. He was probably someone who was managing the household. He was probably someone who was deal, looking after Philemon's money for him. He probably had quite a high position of authority. And so he feels like he's been betrayed by a friend, not just by a slave. So the question is, can I forgive him? And the the second question is, if I forgive him, can I see him as family? Forgiveness is hard enough, but actually saying, well, I forgive you, but I'm going to let you be like a brother to me. That's a tough ask. And I wonder if you've ever had to ask that question. Can I forgive that person? whether it's a friend or a family member, can I forgive that person? Can I see them as family? So we see that according to the Bible we are family. We also see according to the Bible that families are broken. And so what is the hope in all of this? Paul says at the end of the letter, and I might, Mashi, if you could put this one up, it's verse 17 onwards. Paul says to Philemon, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. If he has done any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. So what's Paul doing? This is kind of my best guess. Paul refers to Onesimus as a son, so it means he sees him as family. He also says to Philemon, you're my brother, so he sees him as family. So Paul's kind of in the middle, and he's got Onesimus here, I see him as family. I've got Philemon here, I see him as family. And Paul's kind of stuck in the middle, and he needs a way to get Onesimus and Philemon together without him there. And so there's a couple of assumptions I want to make about Onesimus because he's the one who's done the wrong thing here. So we're going to make, you know, we'll assume a couple of things which will make this relationship restoral possible. So the first assumption is he's aware of his forgiveness. So if... Onesimus has become a Christian, which the letter suggests he has. It means he's come before the cross of Christ. He's realized that his sin is what put Jesus on the cross. And he realized that he needs Jesus to make things right. That's kind of what being a Christian is. The second assumption is that if he's aware that he needs forgiveness, that's led him to repentance. Now, repentance is one of those Christian words, you don't really hear it anywhere else, but what repent means is to change your mind. So when, you know, you see in the Bible, you know, repent and follow Jesus, what that means is change your mind and follow Jesus. Change your mind about all sorts of different things and agree with what Jesus says. So we're assuming that Onesimus has done that. 
And the third thing is that we assume that Onesimus has accepted Jesus as Lord. That he knows he's hurt people. Not just Philemon, but he's hurt other people. And he knows he needs to make it right. And I'm making those assumptions about Onesimus because they're the kind of assumptions that I think we can make about all people who call themselves Christians. That we're aware that we need God. That we're aware that we need forgiveness and we need to change our mind. And that we've accepted Jesus as Lord. So I think what Paul is doing in all of this, when he says... If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I think Paul is putting himself as Jesus in this scenario. And he's saying there's no way that these two people are going to be able to be friends. No way they're going to be family. No way they're going to be able to reconcile unless Jesus is in the mix. So Paul is saying, if he owes you anything, put it on me. And that's kind of crazy because Paul's not even there. Like he's in prison somewhere and he's saying to Philemon, if this guy owes you, charge it to me. And that's what Jesus does. Paul is offering to do what Jesus does for us. He's offering to pay the price. He's offering to be the one that makes relationships right. The thing that everyone needs in their family, the thing that everyone needs to be able to see each other as family, the thing that we all need is a person and it's Jesus. Because he takes the place in between people that can't work it out together and he says whatever the issue is put it on me so if you've hurt someone Jesus says put it on me if you've been hurt by someone Jesus says put it on me and that's what he does on the cross because ultimately any wrong thing that's between us is a wrong thing that's between us and God and Jesus died for that so I think that there's kind of five last things to grab that are the hope for family and they are this and when I say family like I'm talking about your families but I'm talking about us as Christians, as family as well. Our hope is that Jesus is the one that makes families work. Our hope is that, well, there's a reality that because we've all stuffed up, it makes us all equal. So because we've all stuffed up, we're actually all equal and none of us can come into relationships and family and friendships holding ourselves above other people because we're all not that great sometimes. The third thing, though, is that we're all forgiven. If we change our mind, we are forgiven. So if we've hurt people, we've changed our mind about that, and we've apologized for that, then we are forgiven. Because we're forgiven, we can forgive others. So if you're someone who has a really hard time forgiving other people, It's possible that it's because you haven't really wrestled with how forgiven you are. Because when we realize that the God of the universe, who spoke the world into being, next time you're outside, have a look at like a tree and then do your best to speak a tree into existence. (laughs) Or a hill or a river, or a mountain. I was thinking about this the other day, because I was like, I was sitting up on a hill and just kind of looking out, and I was like, the, like, the Bible says that God spoke this into being. So he spoke, and things were made where there was nothing. 
I'm like, I literally can't do that at all. Like, even when I plant things, they normally die. I can only build Lego with instructions. Like, I can't create. But God spoke and things were formed. He's big. He's powerful. He's very different to us. And yet, that being, that God who made everything says, come and be my child. Be part of my family. And so because we're forgiven, we can forgive others. And if we are in this position where we know we need forgiveness, where we freely forgive others, then I think within family, within friendships, within relationships, that things are made right. And so the big point of this letter that Paul wrote to this guy Philemon is this. This guy has wronged you, but I don't want you to hold that against him. I want you to forgive him. And not only that, I want you to change the way you look at him. Don't look at him like he's a slave. Don't look at him like he's any worse than you. Look at him like he's your equal, like he's a brother. And so tonight, it feels probably appropriate, maybe do you want to stand, as we wrap up, that we think about this idea of forgiveness. Now, I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what's going on in your friendships, in your family, in in anything like that. But there's something incredibly powerful that happens in you when you're able to forgive others. And so I'm just going to pray a little, just a prayer. And if you're, I guess, thinking and there's people that maybe pop into head into your head that you think, yeah, I, I probably need to forgive them. Then pray that prayer with me, after me, however you want to do it. Father God, thank you that you invite us into family. Thank you that you invite us to be with you as your, as your children. And Lord, as we think about family and we think about the kind of family that you've invited us into, it can feel really good but also really complicated because family is a messy, complicated thing. People don't always treat each other the way they should. We don't always treat people the way we should. And so, Lord, we need forgiveness. So we ask, Lord, that you would forgive us when we've treated people badly. And we also need to forgive others. So, Lord Jesus, help us to forgive. Lord, help me to forgive. Lord, thank you that you've forgiven us, that you've invited us into closeness, that you've invited us into love, into joy, into relationship. Lord, show us how to do that with you and with others. Amen.